And thank you for joining us, Sports Pub Media Golf Podcast. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Hope you're having a uh, a great week as we um, round into form here. Golf season across the country. Players Championship is behind us. Got a little WGC action match play. We'll get to that. And then, of course, this tournament that's called the Masters. Uh, it's going to happen again in April. Dustin Johnson, the defending champion. And joining me to talk about all things golf and share some incredible stories, I'm sure. Ten-time winner on the PGA Tour, 17 times across the world, including two wins at a golf course that I know really well. It's right down the street here in Ponte Vedra. He's won the Players' Championship twice at TPC Sawgrass. Steve Elkington. Elk, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Travis. Yep, that uh, Players' Championship was an exciting <laughs> ending. I think Justin Thomas made almost played. The perfect round of golf with one really good bounce up 18. Yeah. That did did not ruin his day. Well, you got to get a little luck. Yeah. I mean, every once in a while, you got to hit a shot that's like, oh no. And then it pans out and you win. Freddie, right. That's happened. Yeah. Freddie Couples, uh, 92 at the Masters, held up on Ray's Creek. Mm. Tiger chipping on 16 against DeMarco, came back. Was that luck or was that just Tiger? That one. <sighs> I think that might have been Tiger. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you got to get a bounce once in a while, you know. And you know, I, I was thinking about you because we've been working on doing this, and I came on your show a couple weeks ago, and I was watching PGA National, and there was another Aussie that was playing really well, and that was Matt Jones, and he wins by five. No one made a run at him on Sunday, but he was pretty pure. He, he that had to bring a smile to your face to see another Aussie get back in the winner's circle. Oh, I love Matt Jones. He's uh, I've known him forever. He, he the other place like uh, PGA National is where Matt Jones won the Australian Open, and that's the Australian Golf Club in Sydney. Almost mm. identical, hard golf course, lots of wind, water. Mate, I don't even know why I didn't pick Jonesy in my games last week, but you know, he's always sort of had a swing. I watched your swing sequence of Adam Scott. I actually think he has a better sort of through the ball move than Adam. Adam's more powerful. Yeah. But, um, you know, I don't know what holds players back. Jones, he's, you know, 40, he has three kids. Maybe he's a late bloomer, but he's won the Australian open twice. He won the Houston open right here where I live. Mm -hmm. But yeah, last week, mate, um, I'm sure you know that that course is difficult. I was speaking to Jason Duffner and Pat Perez. They had some trouble at the bear trap and, you know, Jonesy just made it look easy. He was hitting it center of the face. I listened to his interview. He said, he said he was playing so well that he was he would be shocked if anyone beat him. That's a, that's a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I you know I I tweeted that out. I said, look, Matt Jones has as good a golf swing as Adam Scott. Am I wrong? I mean, like I I'm watching these two swings. I'm like, I think Matt Jones might be better. And you and you tend to agree through the impact zone. It's as good as it's getting. You know what's cool also is he's worked with Gary. Uh, barter in yeah. Australia for f 40 years or oh, 20, excuse me, 25 years. They've worked together since he was 15. Matt is 40 now. That's incredible run 25 years together. Those guys getting it done. Yeah. And I mean, when you look at Matt Jones's swing and you, and you broke it down very well, you know, it's easy to analyze it because you're like, okay, he looks good at setup. You know, he sort of hits, goes through the boxes on the way back. He, you know, he's real square with his left wrist and the club face is real nice at the top. It's not upright. It's not flat. He moves the, the body first on the way down and he catches that impact right where you're supposed to. You know, the only, the real um, thing you see about Matt Jones swing is he sees, he leaves his left wrist uncocked all the way through the swing and he has that sort of long left arm going through and wraps around his neck. And that's really, you could see him from a mile away if you knew mm -hmm. his swing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And, um, well, I know you were a, a terrific ball striker as well and still are, and I'm going to get to that here later on in the podcast. But I want to talk about the tour now. is in Texas, your course in Houston. Uh, we got WGC coming up in Austin, and then we go to Valero, and then Augusta. WGC, it's match play. You've played a lot of match play in your days. Um, you like match play, or were you kind of more of a stroke play guy? I never did any good in match play, except when I was a junior. I played tons of match play when I was growing up but you know I don't know why but you know when I I looked at the match play this week and I think there's going to be some exciting you know groups there's a couple of really nasty groups like the one that Justin Thomas is in with Kisner but and yeah. then you've got Bryson Bryson could you know because 
of this golf course and, you know, drop away holes, you can drive it on the greens and he only gets penalized, you know, losing the hole. He may do something crazy this week, which I, I don't know if he is. I'm just sort of setting it up that yeah. way. So, um, no, I think to keep yourself in the game in match play, the great, the great putters, the great chippers, you know, you think of kids in the last year, he, he beat uh, Matt Kuchar. Both of mm-hmm. them are really good at the short game. This is a sort of a control golf course, but I've also in my bracket, mate, I've picked a few bombers in my bracket as well. <laughs> well, you pretty much have to in the modern game, don't you? Now you just, you know, these guys hitting it so far, I can only imagine you're sitting there like, wait, what? He just hit that 335 yards. He's hitting nine iron from a hundred and eighty five. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, I want to ask you, you know, sports pub is, really big into the golf gambling space, which has really taken off. I do a show for him every week. It's called cash out with the coaches and people love it. And I love it. You know, I'm kind of a bit of a gambler myself. I like to wager on a win ticket and head to head matchups and things like that. Were you ever much of a kind of a gambler when you're on the course? Did you, did you like to put money on like side games, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? I know there was a lot of stuff happening before the tournament, right? On those days. Were you ever into that much? I would say yes and yes. We finished <laughs> up being in those games. I, um, particularly when we got into the majors, I remember going to Augusta when I started getting in the Masters regularly. Um, you know, from winning tournaments or you know being in the top thirty, I finished up partnering with Greg Norman, who would always invite me to play with him at a Masters. Pretty good partner, and I yeah. always find myself in a match with Tom Watson or Paul Azinger and Tom Watson or Tom Weiskopf and Tom Watson, and I was. And then all of a sudden the money's up, you know, it's like thousand dollar, you know, one downs and <laughs> all of a sudden I'm out on the golf course, Travis, and I'm, I'm, I'm way out of my element. I've mean, got no idea what I'm doing, but, and I did, but what I really didn't expect was watching, having someone like Tom Watson standing over me, hoping I'm going to miss a three footer. And that was unexpected, but we would play these big matches. I mean, there was some money changed hands, but what it did do for me and did do for everyone else, the reason they did play pretty high on, on these um, Augusta Pro-Am or practice rounds was they wanted it to really ma- mean something on a three or four footer, so, you know, get yourself in that game mode. And I actually found myself once I, once I left that group and I was relieved of that and I got into the tournament, it, I was feeling better, more relaxed when I, you know, got up on the course and started playing, hitting these putts for basically my own score. Yeah, you know, I had Lanny Watkins on this podcast about a month ago. And that's the exact same thing he said. That he said it just kept us sharp. You know, we would go harder on the bigger tournaments because it would get us in the moment. Every shot mattered. There was a really important putt for some money that would never hurt anybody. But, like, it was enough that, like you said, Watson's looking over you like, you're probably going to miss that putt. And I can only imagine, like, that. You know, I mean, that that had to really get the blood pumping. And then all of a sudden, it's Thursday, day one. You're like, I'm good. Off we go. Yeah, I remember one year I made some money on one of those matches. <laughs> and uh, I got a check in my locker. I won't tell you who it was from. But it doesn't matter. It was Lanny's, Lanny Watkins partner, Tom Watson. And in the memo of the check, <laughs> it had a set of McGregor 693 Woods. So it was like a payoff. He bought a set of Woods from me. And I wish I was. I wish I had enough money. I wouldn't have cashed that check, Travis. Because, mate, that would look good on the wall today. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you another one we used to play the British Open or the, mm-hmm. the Open Championship at Muirfield when the course was so hard uh, one year the rough was three feet long and we used to play this other game inside of our game which was $10,000 a man no bogey so if you could play the whole day in your match and not make a bogey you would get 10 grand from each player well the first hole at Muirfield was a par four was like 500 yards everybody was out of the game except Tom Watson he made par and we hawkeyed him all the way around, and he made it to the 18th hole with no bogeys. It was one of the most, the best rounds I've ever seen played. And I was like, "What do I do here? Do I pull against Tom Watson here? To, you know, or do, I'm going to lose 10,000 anyway?" He he pulled his drive and got this real, really bad bounce and went up against the um, in one of those fairway traps. He had to play it sideways, and then he hit a two iron onto the green and he lipped out a 30 footer to take 10 grand each off us and made, I was so relieved because wow, it was, uh, <laughs> so he made a bogey too much. So he made a bogey at the end. Yeah. He made bogey the last, not to win, not to win the $10,000, no bogey. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, Watson, it kind of surprised me because Lanny said the same things. He, he was all in on those, on those big money games. And he also said, Jack would 
participate too. He said Jack would, Nicholas would like to get in there and mix it up, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as well. I never got to play with Jack Nicholas in a practice round for money, but I played with Weisskopf. He, he'd mix it up. When Weisskopf was about 48, I'd stayed with him and his wife out in Phoenix, and we went to Loch Lomond and opened the course together. So I got to know Weisskopf. And when he came out on tour, back on tour to get ready for turn 50, he was like, Elk, get a couple of get a couple of ducks and let's go, you know, roll some ducks, he used to say. <laughs> he wanted me to go find a couple of, couple of guys he could beat so he could get ready for the tour at 48. <laughs> how good was how good was uh how good was white i mean like we you know we hear about jack and you know obviously arnie and gary all the big three but like weiss Koff, he was pretty special too one day i mean he could he could really go weiss Koff, you know was one of the great swingers of all time you know jack jack nicholas never really got any credit for sort of his swing i mean he sort of had yeah. a reverse c he was very powerful um don't want to say he's like Bryson. I mean, Bryson doesn't get a lot of credit for his swing, mm -hmm. but he gets a lot of a lot of credit for his power. Jack was kind of the same, but Jack Jack would always lay up. You know, he if 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 he thought the odds were for him to lay up, you know, hit a one iron off the tee or whatever, he might hit one iron all day. I remember Freddie Couples telling me a story one time. He was playing with Jack at Pebble Beach, and and you know, the first hole is a layup. Freddie hit driver up there, and Freddie said, "I'm just going to hit driver every hole and." cutting corners, got on 18. And by the end of the day, Jack's just looking at Freddie like he's an idiot because, he says, you know, he says, I'm not going to hit a one. I'm just going to keep hitting driver. But Jack, you know, methodically would play up to the right on 18 with a two iron or in layup. And of course I said, well, what happened? What was the scores? And he goes, Jack shot 67. I shot 77. So, <laughs> I think that's one of the, not stop hitting driver. Yeah. I, you know, I think that's a good point. It's one of the things, even in today's game, you know, I'll talk to amateurs and they'll be like, man, these guys are just so aggressive. I'm like, you know, they, they are at times, you know, but like, they're pretty conservative too. Like Tiger was pretty conservative. You know, he didn't, he's, he wasn't an overly aggressive player. And I think to that point, he didn't shoot a lot of course records, you know, like really low round. He just shot a lot of really solid 67s and 68s when everybody else was kind of nudged up to 70 and 71. And a lot of that was just the way that he was kind of plotting himself around now at times. Yeah. I mean, he would, he would certainly be more aggressive, but I think Jack and tiger were kind of the same way in that they just were very methodical. And if anything, probably a bit conservative with their game plan. Well, you're right. Exactly. You know, I think tiger, you know, perfectly copied Jack's thinking, mm -hmm. you know, he won the open championship one year tiger. He hit about three drivers for the week. You know, he had, he had show off power when he wanted to tiger. I remember, you know, being at Pebble beach when he was, you know, in the right rough at two sixty from the green and, you know, in the first cut and flies a three wood, you know, three feet from the hole. And he'd have all this massive show off power, but when he, when he, you know, when he played, he would just, you know, he would play the odds and, and, you know, the odds are so important, as you know, um, you would even know that Tiger was going to do, you You would start to think ahead when he first came to Augusta and won in 97 by 12 and he drove it over the bunker at 18 and all that. But then there he was two years ago when he won, he did it a whole different way. You know, he was laying up, he was doing these different shots. So, you know, Tiger Woods um, has brains when it comes to golf and he knows when to, you know, go to the whip and he knows when to lay it back. Talk about your your swing a little bit and, and kind of how it came about. You were a bit into the golfing machine, right? With Homer Kelly and, and, and how that Ben Doyle, Ben Doyle and, taught me the golf and machine, Ben yeah. Doyle, right? Yeah. He was kind of your, your teacher, but you had a beautiful swing. You're a terrific ball striker. Um, when you watch today's game, is there anybody that kind of reminds me of, 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 reminds you of yourself and the way that they kind of go about it from a, a technique standpoint and that beautiful fluid swing, great, great ball striker, great trajectory all the way to the back? Well, you don't, you know, it's interesting. You don't talk about rhythm much anymore. You know, you, we used to distinctly remember that Tom Watson had a fast rhythm. So did uh, Nick Price. So did uh, Greg Norman. My rhythm was a little bit different, medium pace. I mean, Matt Jones has nice rhythm. Mm -hmm. and I think people, you know, Payne Stewart had nice rhythm. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about nice rhythm is it, it can cover up Travis some, you know, some flaws in your swing. There were some other guys, you know, Don Pooley, uh, 
you know, other guys that had sort of maybe not technically perfect swings, but could play golf really well because their their rhythm would kind of, you know, you were going slow enough, I guess, or fast enough in the right spot to, um, you know, to cover it up. Yeah. Uh, going back to the golf machine, I, I, I love to study the machine because um, it gave me sort of a diagnostic tool. I mean, I don't use it and where it freaks everybody out. Uh, mm-hmm. to look at it and i just learned it as a whole and and when i listen to someone like you i can go hmm i think he's right there or he's not right or this mm-hmm. i use it to look at swings and diagnose them and say okay what's go- what's missing here yeah you know i think of um today's ball strikers you know like i'm really impressed with morikawa you know like i just he's just such lasers you know with his iron game and it's got that, you know, flat little flat lead wrist and gets clubbed down and just matches it up beautifully at the bottom. Um, I, I, I like Hovland too. You know, these two guys, I watch them. They don't, they're, they're really good off the tee. Uh, they're really good into the greens. And yes, Hovland struggles a little bit with his short game. Yes, Morikawa struggles a little bit with his putter. But if you're good from tee to green and, and you do that exceptionally well, you have staying power on the PGA tour because you're going to have some good weeks. Is that accurate? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Morikawa, you know, he has that golfing DNA, as you noted. I mean, you noted how Morikawa hits his fade. I did my fade a little different. I, you know, I had a cup left wrist and I had an open stance. So I played more of a push with a more, more impact, more lean at impact. So I did it a different way, but I was able to control the ball from left to right as well. As you, as you noted there, Mm -hmm. um, you know, then you've got power players like Justin Thomas. Who I like I like his swing. You know, mm-hmm. I enjoy watching Thomas. You know, we went through such an era with our games. You know, we went through Jimmy Ballard where I'd go out of the screen, Travis, on the way back and cover it like Curtis Strange and Hal Sutton. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't for me at the time. And then we went to Mac O'Grady and a bunch of guys that really wanted the left arm on the shoulder plane back here, you know. Mm-hmm. And Justin Thomas now is way up and – um I've always implied that, you know, it's great if you can swing the way you want to and and just have all the rules that go with that to get your desired flight. Yeah, there's a, everybody kind of does it a little differently. It's interesting with you, the little extended lead wrist and then the shaft lean, and that's the way that you hit your fade. It's really easy to get going down, barking up the wrong tree, I would imagine, uh, all the stuff that's available to you. And and all of a sudden you get lost and then pretty soon you can't find it again. And and this is what you do. I want to ask you about another Ozzy taking you back in your day, and that was Greg Norman, um, who is a little bit older than you. Um, what, seven, eight years, perhaps yep. older than yeah, you right now? Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how talk, talk about your relationship with Greg when you were back and you guys were playing, and and you know just just how good of a driver of the ball Greg Norman was. Well, he was like the longest driver on our tour and the straightest. I mean, think about the most accurate when you think of like someone like Cal Pete or an our tour Jim Furyk. And then you think of the longest, like Bryson DeJambeau. Well, then you put together, like the Jim Furyk and Bryson together, that was Greg Norman. Wow. The greatest and the longest. But, you know, Greg, you know, he sort of ruined his swing at the end of his career. I say ruined it. He got shorter and, and crossed the line a little bit. And that he was one, you know, he, he shortened it. But in his day, when he wound it up, he had that real, you know, took it, you know, Jack Nicholas takeaway with the club off the ground, almost like Matt Jones. Mm-hmm. And then he would set, set those legs on the downswing first. And then he would just whip it with the, with the hands and arms and come up underneath it. And he was just able to keep that face in the zone a long time. He wasn't a great short iron player, but he was a great putter and he was a great chipper and a great driver. Yeah. Was he, did he like to mix it up a little bit in the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday games, or was he kind of, kind of over on his own? Definitely mix it up. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Really? Okay. Definitely. Yeah. He was always the one that had the most toys and the most cash, you know, so <laughs> we were always That's trying great. to mix it up with him because he had stuff available to mix it up with. <laughs> yeah. I was going to, that was my next question is like, who, whose cash just meant a little bit more? Like when you, it didn't matter if it's five bucks, give me that five bucks because that Matt, I would imagine Greg had to be on that short list. When in five from him. Lanny, Lanny was hard to be. Lanny hated losing. I mean, you had him on this podcast. You probably sensed it. He would do anything to fight you off for five, for sure. <laughs> Trevino. I mean, I was in a couple of matches with Trevino. Trevino would like, when he was down, he would he would talk in the middle of your swing. He didn't care. He, was just, <laughs> he, he didn't want to lose. 
so we had some, you know, had some fun with all that. I told Lanny, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to say something to you and tell me if this is accurate. I said, I don't know if I would want to play with you guys back in the day, but I said, because when I was growing up, you know, like I was little, just getting into the game when I was watching you guys in your heyday. Um, I said, you, Hell Irwin, um, Raymond Floyd, I said, you guys would have just scared the dog lickings out of me. Like, you guys just look intense, competitive, and probably downright mean when it came down to it, in particular on these Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday games. Was that accurate? I, who am I, who am I, I missing on that about list? Raymond. Ray, Raymond won. Raymond, I, Raymond and I won the Shark Shootout together uh, out in Sherwood. And I, I think Raymond would have betted bet against me in the match and i was his partner you know but i remember i remember a story um i was there i was i wasn't even on tour yet and lenny watkins had just won the tournament of champions at la costa then he went over the to the desert and shot like no he might have won he might have won la first and then he one or the other he won both back to back bob hope at about 25 under went to riviera won and 25 under this would have been about 85 or 86 he came to houston to work with Claude Harmon Sr. at Lockenbar. And uh, he was getting ready to take a week off. And Claude Harmon drove around with Lenny Watkins. With Dick Harmon, of course, was still alive. And it was even before Butch was the pro at Lockenbar. And, and mm. I was out there watching this guy, Lenny Watkins, and he was hitting the ball unreal, right? I mean, you had to lean sideways to see the flag because he was literally hitting the flag every hole. And if you ever watch tape of him of that year when in LA, I mean, he hit it like this about six times on Sunday with six irons. But after all those days, Claude Harmon said, uh, we were at lunch and, and uh, Lanny said, well, what do you, what'd you see, Mr. Harmon? What do you, what do you think I need to work on? And Claude Harmon said something like, Lanny, I got, I got, I think three things you need to work on. And Lanny leaned in. He said, he said, the first one he says is when you go to the golf course, you need to make sure that you have your clubs with you. That's number one. He said, <laughs> the second one, he says, you need to change the way you go to the bank each week because someone might be following you, he says. That was number two. <laughs> and number three, I think, I don't even remember what number three. It wasn't as cute as one and two, but it was like, you don't have anything to work on. Right. Hey, get out of here. He, I think he finished leading money with that year on tour. It was just incredible. And I was like, I can't play on tour with these guys. It was so intimidating, as you just said. I was got on tour in 86, 87. I'm looking down the range of these guys, and I'm like, what am I doing here? Mm. yeah it's such a, there's so much there to like think about and chew on you know like as a young player like yourself trying to find your way but then also um just what lanny was going through maybe feeling the need like man maybe i should maybe i'm missing something i need to be doing something different and then a coach saying look just just keep doing just protect your dna and go right i mean <laughs> It takes me into it takes me into this conversation with Rory, who felt the need that all of a sudden he needed to go after more distance, and now he's worked him into a tough situation where his iron game is really struggling. That one really baffled me, Elk. Is Rory being so candid about feeling the need to chase more distance because of the influence of Bryson DeChambeau? It hit you the same way. Yeah, I, I, you know, of course, I follow you and I listen to a lot of things, and you probably listen to things I say too, but. I was mm -hmm. really surprised at Bay Hill when Rory hit two balls in the water on Sunday at Bay Hill on number six. Of course, we saw what Bryson did the day before, carried it across. And I just felt like, well, Jack Nicholas or Tiger wouldn't have tried to hit two balls across that far with what yeah. Rory did. I said, why is he doing that? What, what, why does he think he needs to? I was telling my son, I said, why does he think he needs to do that? He could probably hit a two iron off the two or a three wood out to the right and have another three iron and knock it on the green. And now he now. As you've noted, he's going to Pete Cowan. Is it really yeah. a swing problem he has here, or is it a sort of a um, is it a um, confidence problem, or is it a I've been beat up a lot on Sundays problem? I don't know. I, what do you think? Is it is it a Sunday problem? Is it a confidence? I mean, he certainly uh, is one of the gifted players we have on tour, and you and I could sit there and watch his swing and say yes. At times, he shifts it a little bit too far from the inside on the way yeah. down. However. Aim it. He, he knows how to aim it. He's done that his whole life. Yeah. You know, I was a little critical of Rory about a month ago. I felt like he was turning a lot of 70, 71 rounds into 73s and 74s. Like, there just wasn't a lot of fight there. Like, he wasn't grinding, you know, like you see players do. Professionals, to me, are the best at, 
you watch like a Jordan Spieth, it looks like he's shooting 74 and he posts 200. It's like, how did he just do that? Like, that was amazing. He hit it everywhere. Um, and for Rory, I just, like, I just felt like there was no fight there. I think it's more mental with Rory, if, in my opinion, at this point. Yeah, there's some things unravel, but you're not reinventing the wheel with Rory. You know, Pete knows that. Like, it's just, let's get a couple things back in line. And I just think he needs to be kind of reinforced a little bit. Like, look, you're, you're, you're good is good enough. I mean, he's already one of the best players in the world. You don't need 20 yards to go chasing this and that. Like, just reestablish your own identity that we grew accustomed to loving in Rory McIlroy when he was winning major championships. And then I think he, you know, he builds his confidence and, and off he goes. That's just, that's just my, I feel like he was kind of reaching. He's kind of lost his identity, you know, Elk. And he was kind of like, okay, maybe I should go for more distance or maybe I should, you know, and when you start doing that, then your confidence just goes away and the fight's gone. And that's, I think that's, in my opinion, on the outside looking in, I'm not in the camp. That's, that's how I saw it with Rory. And, and I think he'll be back. And there's no question there. You're not reinventing anything with Rory. It's just getting the wheels turning again and off he goes. And, you know, it leads me to Bryson who's generated all this buzz. I mean, it's pretty crazy, you know, what he's done. Um, I think to the psyche, to a lot of, a lot of players, right. Feeling the need, man, I need to go out and I got to get 20 more yards, right? Well, or, or do you? Yeah, you know, uh, CT Pond, yeah, you probably need to get a few more yards. Rory, I don't know. Bryson, it's it's the impact. It, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned that I studied the golf machine. That's what, that's what I like, what I learned from that for 10 years with Ben Doar, just studying it. And I can explain why, how Bryson gets all his power, but and that's great. And Bryson actually came to me at the LA Open and asked me a few questions just because he just wanted to, hash it out a little bit with someone else that knows about it. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, certainly Bryson uh, is in everybody's heads, but you know, Dustin Johnson came out and said, look, I'm not chasing distance. I hit it plenty far. And that was the end of that conversation with him. One of the things about Dustin Johnson, everybody thinks he's stupid or he's dumb or he doesn't know what he's talking about, but he's really smart in my mm -hmm. opinion, because he's, he's, it's so easy for him to just block out all the noise. And he just says, Oh, I, I haven't thought about the master's menu or, no, I haven't really thought about that. Thanks for asking, but I haven't thought about it. And to me, it's unreal. Now, to answer your question, would Hale Irwin go for more distance if he was on tour? Would, Len would Tom Kite? Would all these other guys do that? And I still think there's room, Travis, on tour for accuracy with irons. Yeah. Like Morikawa. I mean, I think Russell Knox is leading uh, Greens in Reg at about 70 one or two percent normally about 70 percent leads the leads the year mm -hmm. for the year so you know i'd be going if i was on tour right now i'd be going for that 70 percent in greens and reg and i'll just take what what's crumbs left over mate that's what i'd be thinking <laughs> yeah i mean yeah, you kind of are who you are right like you have to go out and play your game and you know i think you can incrementally get more distance it's never too late it's certainly you know better to do it when you're younger you know, like the, this generation that's kind of come out here in the next 10 years, it's going to be longer. Those outdoors can bun it out their 310 and just barely even, you know, take a pass at it. It's so we're, they're going to get longer as they come out. It's just really interesting right now. The guys that are in the heat of the battle feeling that need to have to change something up. Jordan Spieth lost three years of his career in his prime, in his prime, lost three years chasing distance. That's just that is um, it's sad, really, at the end of the day, because. I love Jordan Spieth. The golf golf <clears throat> loves him. They need him, you know, and and now he's kind of worked his way back. But all of this was after more power and didn't pay off. Well, you finish up ruining the, your smaller swing when you go for distance off the tee. You know, Rory said it last week, I think, or two weeks ago that, you know, he went for a ton of distance off the tee and it finished up affecting his wedge swing or fixing his seven iron swing and goes back to a, what we were talking about 10 minutes ago is, you know, did he need a ton of distance at players to win? No, he doesn't need it. Does he need it at Key or Island? Probably not. Does he need it at Augusta? Does he need more at Augusta? Probably not. So if you if you sat down with one of these players and you, we're outside, obviously looking in, would Raymond Floyd change anything? And you know, the the question would have to be asked: How many events on tour do you think you're still in the game without doing anything? And I would say most. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you know you don't need a ton of distance at Augusta because everybody can reach everything around there so you want accuracy but you know this is a conversation that will be never ending but certainly <laughs> bryson has bent the bar mate he has heated up the iron bar and he has bent it over his knee and he's got everybody looking at him 
you know, he, he's done it everywhere. He's done it with his wedges. He's not a great wedge player. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine hitting your sand iron with a six iron shaft. Uh, people keep saying he's got all these short games. He doesn't have a great short game. They say he's got a pretty good wedge game, but the stats say, I don't know, what, what, I'll be interested to hear what your take is. It's a pretty good little chipper and a good little uh, great putter. Yeah. But Yeah. No, I think he's great. I think, you know, he's obviously great off the tee. He's chewing people up off the tee, and he's a great putter. I think those are the two things he's great at, and those are two things to be really great like at. Greg, I think it's like Greg Norman's strengths. Yeah, I was just going to say, he is, he's a lot like Greg Norman. He's long, and he's he's pretty damn straight. I mean, he's not... You know, it's not like he sprang it all over the place. Um, now, he certainly, everybody has that, those those moments where you do. We saw it at Augusta where in November he, he was pretty erratic um, there. But um, his strengths were his driver and his putter. I see the PGA Tour, yeah, you got to be long enough for sure. Certainly a little more helps. But you better be good in the approach game. You know, you better be good in stroke scan approach. I mean, that is, give me a ball striker. And then from there, give me someone who can have good, weeks putting you can't be a dog you got to have some good weeks putting um that's kind of that's kind of how i see it in today's game i mean the short game it's interesting i want to ask you about this the short game is important we know that but when i look at the models and the statistics and how tournaments play out stroke scan around the green is always towards the bottom you, you know it's like iron game approach game some distance putting's right there you know and then it's like around the green and and uh, is that how it was like in your game when back in your day was that a similar type of model or was it the short game you felt like had more value? Well, it's just, it's a very interesting conversation. Um, short game matters a lot to Jordan Spieth, right? He's yeah. very good at it. Um, does it matter all the time? I mean, strokes gain is another pet peeve of mine, which is strokes gain doesn't know where you missed it, mm -hmm. so. It only knows that you missed a green and you chipped. And and so strokes gain is important for tour players to look how they stack up against one another. But it's terrible for taking all strokes gains for betting because, let's face it, uh, I could be, you and I could be playing a tournament and I could be above the hole every putt and I got no chance of making it. You could be right below the hole and you'd show up as a ton better strokes gain than me and mm -hmm. it may not be that way. So that's, that's one thing. But... Um, when I think of short game, Travis, you know, I sort of think of the short game from about inside of a hundred, you know, mm. uh, for me, you know, because that's really, you know, where it's dangerous. Lanny Watkins was good in there. Tom, Tom Kite was the best. No one could even touch some Raymond Floyd. And, and of course the most important thing is where are you when you miss the green? Because mm -hmm. sometimes you can't do anything. And, does that weigh in with Tiger? Was Tiger a great short game guy because he always had room to play and never left himself no room because he was such a strategy player? Or Jack? Jack was a terrible chipper and got lessons uh, in the middle of his career from Phil Rogers, saved his whole career. Mm. And But you'd never see Jack where he couldn't do something. So I'm not even sure I answered your question there, mate, but uh, it's very important to whom, right? Yeah. And when. Yeah, you have to. No, I mean it, we we know it's important, right? It's just interesting to like think about it because I don't think stroke scan tells you the whole story as well. I tend to agree that it's important and it does help you stack up to other players for sure, and it gives you a picture. But to your point, when you miss a green, where are you missing it, right? And what are you leaving yourself with? Because we know the probability of getting it up and down a little more green to work with versus someone who's stymied themselves, like you know, short sighted themselves they don't have that probability. So there's more to the story. Um, yeah, I, let me give you a more sure. extreme example. You and I play, you hit 18 greens in reg all above the hole. And I hit no greens in reg, just short every hole. And I chip up, I'm a great chipper and I chip up to an inch and tap in. And I might beat you on the putting, putting game that day by 10 strokes. I don't know. Yeah. And does that really give you the the true picture of strokes gained putting? Probably not. Probably no. you might have hit it on the green in two on par five and you beat me for the day. So there's a deeper level that you have to understand. It's easy to get on social and say that, you know, you don't know what you're talking about with strokes gained, but it's strokes gained doesn't know where you are on the, <laughs> on the course. Yeah. It's such a fascinating game. You can get it. You can get it done, you know, a lot of different ways. Your era, just listening to you talk about these players, Greg Norman was such a, 
terrific driver of the ball. And then, you know, you had uh, L- Lanny in his iron game and Kite in his wedge game and Crenshaw in his putter. Like, you got to be great at something, don't you? I mean, you have to have something that you're that you're great at. Like, Spieth's great around the greens. Dustin's great off the tee. Morikawa's great with it. Like, there's, there's got to be something you can hang your hat on. Like, I'm great at this and really use that as your your launching pad, if you will, right, on tour. Trevino said, you know, God didn't give everyone everything. And he said, thank God. He said they took chipping away from Jack Nicklaus. You know, he said, <laughs> he, Trevino also said he was born too early because he said, if I would have had hybrids, I would have won the masses five times because I couldn't hit my three iron on the green like Jack. So nobody gets everything. For me personally, I wasn't a great chipper of the ball. Um, you know, we were at 55 degrees back then. 60 didn't come around for a little bit there. Yeah. But when I did, work on my chipping quite a bit and I was able to get comfortable with what I was doing mate I could go at it a lot more with my iron knowing that if I did miss in certain spots we used to have went through a period on tour Travis where there was quite a bit of rough around the greens just week to week they mm. they do it in stretches on tour now they'll set up the greens queue and say we're going to do two inches of rough we're going to do it at every course across the whole tour it was a little different. Um, for example, we might go to LA and it might be four inches. Then we might go to New Orleans and it might be five inches. And then we might go to TPC and there was none. And I kind of enjoyed that difference. Hilton had one year. I remember it was this, you know seven inches. So if you did hit a screaming five iron at the pin, it was just going to barely go off the green. Now, what could you do from it there? So there was a bunch of different setups and I, I kind of enjoyed that. It's kind of yeah. changed now. They're going for TV. They're going for looks. They're going for a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, those are good points. You know, there, there's there's not much rough, you know, anymore. You know, you look at it every once in a while, you'll get you'll get some rough and you'll see the ball nestling down a little bit more. But I mean, at PGA National, the ball was to me, it looked like it was pretty well perched up. You know, Sawgrass had a little bit uh, more than usual, but nothing, you know, nothing crazy. Um, and I would think this week we're probably not going to see much at WGC. They're going to want scoring. Um you know, they're going to want ac- action birdies and eagles and, you know, let them, let them go for it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, who, uh, who it's do you have this week, mate? Cause my yeah. pick is my pick is psycho who I got okay. in the tournament. All right, that's what I wanted to finish up with here. I'm going to share oh, with okay. you my bracket. All right. So here's who I've got in the final four. Uh, I'll, I've got, uh, Hatton versus Bryson and Spieth versus Rom. Those are my Mate, four. I, we've got one close. I okay. I got Kokrak taken out, Bryson, over in that in that one on, okay. the, on that on the left side. Kokrak's been it. putting out of his mind, and I actually had um, I had a uh, crack beating Answer. I think Answer was is due for a good week. Very straight hitter falls into that mold of Kisner. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying this is how I did it. Um, in the bottom one there, I had. I think I had Ryan Palmer coming out of that bottom group. The Texan putts good, drives it good. Mate, and we both had Jordan Speed. I think (laughs) Jordan Speed is the worst person to play in match play. I agree. When his game is almost good because he can make it from anywhere on every green. And if he misses a green, he's going to chip it in or close. And it's just a nightmare to play. (laughs) And he's he's back. I think he's back. It's good to see him back. Um, He's keeping it in front of him. His iron games pick up again. And I agree, man. He gets that putter going. He just, he just, he'll you know, wear you out. Who, who do you have? With? Do you have Spieth too? Okay. Nope. So I've got Rom beating Spieth and I've got Bryson beating Hatton. And then I'm, I, you know, I went with John Rom, and here's why. I think he's just been kind of like turning the wheels, seventh, 10th. The putter's been a real, little chilly for him. Last week he picked it up um, or his last outing at, at players. Putter was a little bit better. So I, I think he he kind of builds on that and and has a really good putting week. That's what he's missing. He needs a good putting yeah. week. And I think this is the week. I think you're right about Ram. I'd like to see Ram. He's got that knob, right? That that turn, that volume where it's like really, you know, intense, like a Spaniard. But mm-hmm. then it's too much, right? Where he, mm. oh, I saw him at players almost break the putter over his head while he was walking down the fairway like Woody Austin. That's too much, right? He's got to back mm-hmm. that off just a little bit and just sort of relax a little bit, you know. Um, but I, like I told you there, I think I had, I have speed going all the way. I think it's going to be okay, a runaway cool. train this week for him. I love it. I love it. I, I, well, golf, 
would love it if Jordan Spieth won. I mean, and mate, I wouldn't be remiss without U of H, the Houston Cougars in the March Madness Sweet 16 to play Syracuse on Saturday. I had to had to drop that in there. Too. I love it. I love it. March Madness has delivered this year. Unbelievable, unbelievable tournament upset, close games. Houston's playing well. I grew up in the Northwest, so Who's I actually grew team? up like, well, I grew up probably what thirty five minutes from Spokane, Washington. So Gonzaga oh. has always been, you know. This could be the year they do it. I, I think they've got the best team. They just got to put it together. Not a bad bus to jump on there, mate. No, no, not at all. Elk, I could talk to you for the rest of the day, but I know you're busy. And um, we got to do this again. I appreciate you having my show. I appreciate you doing the uh, Sports Pub podcast here. And um, let's uh, let's see let's see who wins the Dell. And uh, we'll, I've got, uh, I'm, I'm going to post my bracket this afternoon, or today. Okay. I think it's going to be posted about now. So let's let's see how we do. Okay, sounds good. Steve, thanks. thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Take care.